would you like a church in the next 20 years to be around that your children can worship in like we worship in this morning? Do you really want that? Are you willing to sacrifice for that? You see, that's where the question comes in. Today, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. And I know this text here, we're going to read verse 14. And before that, it's talking about our spiritual gifts. Where much is given, much is... That's exactly right. So today, I want us to kind of... We're going to kind of go over the foundation that we have to build. This is a spiritual campaign. We've uh, done many since we've been here. But our church has grown tremendously depth-wise. Not just width-wise, but depth-wise as far as spiritual growth. There's a lot of, um, I guess this is the best way to say it, there is a lot of uh, arguments that you will not experience in Union 3 because people have grown up enough to know better that that would not be a good argument. You see, and that's what spiritual growth does. Just like in your home, when your teenagers become older, they don't, they're not supposed to cry like they did when they were one year old. Amen? But when they do, it shows that they're immature. It shows they didn't grow up. So if you would, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. And let's prepare our hearts and minds to receive this. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. amen. I believe the Word of God. I, the word of God. I, trust, in I trust in God's promises. To mold me. Mold me. To strengthen me. Strengthen. To encourage me. Encourage. To save me. And to send me. Today I will listen. Today I will learn. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 14. It says that we should no longer be children. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the trickery of men. And the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Let's pray. Father I pray that this morning you keep me focused. There is so much here for us to look over. And God, I pray that I want to do a good job of laying out what it is for the person who's only been saved a week, for the person who's been saved 20 years. Father, help me to be balanced this morning. I need your help. God, I need your help this morning. And God, I need you to balance me to where you hide me behind your cross and you get all the glory of everything that's said here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said... The, every problem you face in your life comes from immaturity. When you make bad decisions, when we don't have wisdom, and now there's a difference between earthly wisdom and godly wisdom. Earthly wisdom tells you to get all you can, save all you got, have a retirement, and you become stingy with money that you're going to die in your bank account because you think that way. But the thing of it is, God has taught us to have a given spirit. Now, given's not just monetarily given is with our the fruits of our labor and the and and how we do it with our prayers we are more stingy in america with our prayers than anything else the prayer is the one thing that we don't do we're too busy we're too busy we if i was to ask for people to stand up who spent a solid 30 minutes in solid prayer to god this morning there would be very very few people stand up in this room if you had integrity There would be very few people because if we were all praying 30 minutes a day, we wouldn't have no extra seats in this sanctuary. You see, that's the power of prayer. Most of the problems in our life comes from bad decisions. Why? Because we make decisions based on feelings instead of decisions based on faith. Don't be manipulated by moods. Be honest. When you feel good or don't feel good, don't let that determine whether or not you're going to be faithful or not faithful. That's just immaturity. It, we need to grow. And let me ask you something. Today, when you look at the jerk, church in general, do you see people that's more concerned about their feelings than they are their faith? When you're at work and you see people who's been going to church for 20 or 30 years old, that's why people get mad and leave the church when you don't paint the color of the wall as color's supposed to. Or when you don't put their carpet in. Or when you remove something. We can become so saturated by our feelings that we forget we're here to celebrate our faith. It, it, today, I want you to understand there's only one foundation 
if you are to finish strong, and that's maturity in Jesus. All of us are supposed to grow to spiritual maturity. So how many people do you see that ever demonstrate spiritual dim- disciplines in the Bible Belt where we live? If I was to ask you to name, I had this, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of my notes, I know I am. I want you to name me one student that you know without a shadow of a doubt they're going to heaven and they're mature spiritually. We should be able to name a bunch. But by their actions, we can't. Now, we have awesome students. I'm just using them as an example because I don't want to hurt of a lot of adults' feelings. But we have adults that act far worse than our students in the, in the Bible Belt today. We have adults that have lost sight. We want, to, we want to leave a church in the next 20 years, but the truth of the matter is our own children are not coming to church because they've seen us live in the past 20 years. They've watched our lives. They've seen us demonstrate. They watched us fuss and they watched us do church. We need to stay focused on Christ and we need to be positive about what Christ is doing. If he's coming back, say amen. amen. Today is about spiritual maturity. We have done several campaigns. We've done um, uh, 40 Days in the Word. We've done uh, uh, done, uh, 40 Days of Purpose. Uh, We've done uh, several, 40 Days of Community. And now we're going to do, I think this is the most important one we've had. Now, Rick Warren is the one who designs this material. And sometimes I'll hear people say comments like, well, that Rick Warren, you know, I just don't quite agree with him. Were you not going to eat a hot dog because Charles Manson does? Rick Warren has reached more people for Jesus than everybody combined in the state of Alabama. You may not agree with his tactics, or you may want to have an opinion about that, but how about go reach somebody for Jesus before you do? And when you do, I want you to understand, even Paul himself, when people come to him about that concept, he said at least Jesus is being talked about. At least the gospel is being shared. And and before we get into this, I want to tell you, there's a lot of difference in the culture in California and the culture in Alabama. That's why if if you was to take your Sunday school class and your teaching the way you do to California, you'd be the laughing stock of the state of California. Because you will not be, you will not have common ground with the culture. The culture is different. We have to become, we have to become all things to all men. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So in studying this, I don't want you to start picking apart who wrote it. I want you to look deep inside of you of what you're not doing and what you can do better and celebrate the things that you are doing right. Now, 40 days of purpose and 40 days of prayer, this is, this is very timely. Where we are in our community and the things. And guys, let me say this in wisdom. This is not for you to go to the high school and say, I told you. This is for you to grow up and understand no man will ever be powerful enough to take prayer out of something. You know, I've heard this, that people have been doing the Lord's Prayer at the ball games. Well, can I give you a little bit? I want, I want to change. It's not the Lord's Prayer. It's the model prayer. When was the last time you heard the Lord have to repent of sin? And isn't it powerful that you hear in the stands of people praying that you've never heard pray in public before in their life? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. And everything begins to change. We need to become people who pray not because somebody said we couldn't. We need to pray because God said we can. Amen? Now, as we look through this, you have to understand... We want Jesus to be lifted up. We want you to become spiritually mature. That, that you begin to understand that, that God has a place for you, but you have a foundation that you have to build on. Today, we have churches full of people that all they did was come forward and said a prayer. All they did. And that prayer, listen, that prayer can save you. It saved me. I said that prayer, and it did something inside of me. It prayed. When I hear people get negative about the senior prayer, about the, the sinner's prayer, I'm just saying to myself, don't do that. Because you, unless you pray a prayer of repentance, you're not getting saved. And whether you're out loud or silent, you have to do that. God cannot repent for you. You have to do that. So never become negative about the way people become part of the family of God and the way they're saved. 
Ephesians 4.14 says, We are not meant to remain as children at the mercy of every chance of wind of teaching. Instead, we are meant to hold firmly to the truth in love and to grow up in every way into Christ. Christ is our example. Christ is the one we're supposed to become like. And the sooner you stop comparing yourself to other human beings, the sooner you're going to have the joy that God intended for you to have. Now, point number one is this. We grow when we, need, we feed on God's Word. You know, there, is spirit, there are six spiritual laws here. And these spiritual laws are very important. Just like the law of thermodynamics and the, and the laws that we've seen, there is six spiritual laws. You will not grow spiritually if you do not hold these six laws. You will not. You will not. You will become stagnant. You will become a statistic. And you will become someone who feels like you failed your family and your friends. And you struggle and you will never feel good about yourself. But right now, we're going to focus on six Six spiritual laws that we must apply to our life. Church, I am trying to be as, as analytical and as plain as I possibly can. If I could tell you the problem in the church in America, it is what I am preaching to you today. People do not understand the power of the Word of God. The power of the Word of God has the power to transform you. And when you are transformed, you become powerful. How do you be- You cannot, guys, you cannot become transformed if you're not going to get in the Word of God. You're going to have to do that. That's the reason so we see people struggle with salvation. Because if they could see the value of what God has done, what does that mean? That means smile a little more. That means Raise your hands a little more. If you're led, you don't have to raise your hands to worship God. But you, I don't think God's going to tell you to sit there and cross your arms. I really don't. God's not. The devil will. But we can't even blame that on the devil. Most of the time we just do that because we do that. Amen? Become bigger than your problems. Don't let your moods determine your growth. It's not based on feelings. It's based on faith. This is your soul food. How would we look like if we pigged out on Sunday? And some of us do. Amen? We pig out on Sunday, man. Man, we go, we, 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 uh, we eat meat, we eat whatever we can get our hands on. Uh, we just think we're starving to get death because we have an hour or two hours. You know, man, we don't even know what hunger is. But what would you look like if the only day you eat was Sunday and the rest of the week you fasted and you didn't do anything? I, don't want to, I, I correct that. I don't even want to call it a fast. I want to say you don't eat. How healthy would your body be if you did that? You ate one day a week and that's it. You wouldn't be healthy. Well, that's what our churches look like. Today we have churches, and listen, putting quotes of Scripture on Facebook is not studying the Word of God. I mean, I I think some of these people on Facebook, you think you're Billy Graham's daughters and you're Billy Graham's son. I mean, you have to, now you can tell when somebody puts a quote that has studied the Scripture because they add to it. And it becomes powerful. Why? Because they can't just be quiet about it. You have to feed on God's word. This is the reason so many churches struggle. We are naturally inclined to build a body that harbors sin instead of Jesus. That's why there's such a struggle all the time. It is so easy to get back in our sin nature. It's so easy to get negative. It's so easy to say, well, God, I'm just going to take a break. Listen, some people asked, told God they were going to take a break and they never even truly got to work. I'm telling you, we have to get into the place that God shows us. When we feed on God, the Word of God, we will not try to dilute it to say what we want it to say. That's how I know of the immaturity that is in the Bible Belt where we live. Because people study the Word of God to prove that they can live this way or that they can get away with this or that they can do this. Friend, the best thing for you to do is separate yourself from those kind of people because they will do nothing but dilute you. That is not truth. When truth gets a hold of you, it's going to be like you're sitting on a bed of thorns, just like I talked about last week. It is going to be uncomfortable, and it is not going to be easy. It is not going to be good. And God never stops doing that in our life. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus people says this, People need more than bread for their life. They must feed on every word of God. Uh, what if you only just ate that one meal and nothing else? 
How would you, I mean, it, we, we can't do that. Young people, you can't do that. Here's the problem I see with young people today, and I'm talking about college age and younger, uh, younger and our college group. Somewhere along the line, you guys are going to have to start serving God. Man, you guys, you, Paul and Monica, y'all do great at organizing and going to Tontons and doing all these things and everything. But there has to come a time when our college students graduate. And there has to come a time when our seniors in high school graduate. You can't just stay in the high school, middle school. You can't just stay in the middle school. We have to graduate to serving God somewhere along the line. We have to mature. And if you're not careful as leaders, man, I don't want nobody to leave Union 3. I want everybody to stay here. I want everybody to come here. But God wants to send missionaries out of our church to places and to serve places. And I don't want to see anybody go. But sometimes it has to happen. Every time it has to happen for us to grow on the foundation that God has given us. We have to grow up. Your children, when they grow up, what are they going to do? Praise God, kick them out. The most unhealthy thing that you will do is have a child that just never grows up. That's what we see in our churches today. We're seeing people, and it's not their fault. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, the fault it is, is churches never knew that we were supposed to grow people and equip people to be able to know how to handle a checkbook. Or, and I'm using that as an example. But I'm talking about spiritually speaking, to know how to manage things. Uh, how do you feed? I love this. This is an illustration. If you believe that Satan can steal things away from you, say amen. If you don't, read Matthew 13. Okay, now here, here's the way he put it. He said, your pinky, there's ways, there's ways that we hear. There's a way that I need to grasp God's word. And number one is my pinky is how I hear. It's how I, 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 I learn by hearing. My, my, my ring finger is, is reading. I, I learn by reading. And for a lot of us, if you're like me, I can read a chapter and not even have, have comprehended nothing. I'm thinking about something the whole time. So the, the middle finger is memorizing. The point finger is meditate. And the, and the, and the thumb is how we apply it. I know, and now here's, here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. Come up here, Owen. Come on. Take it away from me. You got it? All I did was come to the service and listen today. That's all I had. Okay? It's so easy for somebody to pull that out of your hand. And by the way, most of us are not sitting in this room writing down nothing. If I ask you tomorrow what was said today, very few of you are going to remember anything. Okay? The next one is, is read. Okay? Try to pull it out of my hand. Don't be a wimp, son. Come on. There you go. That boy is strong now. That's the reason I said that. Okay? He can steal. But I apply these concepts, and I let my palm come up, and I take it out of my hand. I'll lift you up, son. No, that's right. Thank you, Owen. No, no. But see, that's why we have to have spiritual disciplines in our life. The devil just comes and steals things away from us because we're just sitting and thinking, okay, well, I'm good at listening. I can do that. Well, that's okay, but, but you, you, you don't have a good grasp on what God wants you to be. Uh, our, a, prayer, a poor prayer life is a spiritual condition. It's a spiritual condition. How do I know the people don't pray? Because they get their feelings hurt all the time. The greatest sign of immaturity is you can't say anything right, you can't do anything right, if anything happens. When people pray powerfully, it does not matter what you do to them, they're still going to talk to you. Because their, 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 uh, their value and identity comes from who God told them they were. You can't rob them of that. Okay, so when you pray, our students, would you agree with me that we need to grow our students up to be strong spiritually so that people and bullies, and by the way, bullies have been around for a long time, okay? They, they, they've been around, I used to get in a fight every day in the first grade, okay? It happens, it happens, but, but bullies tell them their identity is one thing, God tells them their identity is another. If we're not careful, mom and dad tells them it's something that ain't neither one. God didn't say it and the bully didn't say it. Mama said this. Mama needs to know what God says before she can tell her son what, who he is. 
We need to give our kids their identity and, and, and promote that identity in them. How do we do that? We feed on the Word of God. Here's the action step that you take. You need to have daily time with God for 40 days. You need to make a discipline that you spend time with God. And I'm not talking about time to God and to, to try to prove something to somebody or to, to prove that something's right or something's wrong. You need to have 40 days with God. That he just talks to you and He walks with you. And he loves on you so that you won't have to try to figure out if your identity comes from what somebody said about you or what the Word of God says about you. Amen? Next step, number two, is we grow when we learn in different ways. God loves diversity. That's why he made us all different. I'm not like anybody in here. Praise God. Don't y'all say amen, but no. But I'm not. I'm not like anybody. I'm telling you, you're not like anybody. Some church folk are weird, man. You're weird. You're weird. God made you weird. Be weird proudly. Man, just be weird. You know why we're talking we're weird? Because some man created what the perfect man's supposed to look like. They forgot to read the Word of God and see what God said he looked like. You know, we're not supposed to compare ourselves. Now, God uses diversity. God made us all to be different. He never made copies. He never made clones. Look at Luke 3.18. It says, in many different ways, John preached... The good news to the people. He did it in different ways. Different styles. You do it by listening like we talked about. You do it. And how is listening? You learn. You, people who love to learn by listening like on Sunday morning. There are people in our church. They attain. You ask them what was preached tomorrow and they will tell you. They can remember it. They attain it. They have it. Those people love church. They love church. They love you. Will never hear them say, "Man, I just, I just." No, you love it. Why? Because that's the way you learn. Then you have those that learn by watching and reading, and that's visual. What that means? Show it to me, Pastor. Give me an example of it. Show it. We do it by watching, by illustrations, and by doing it. And then we have by talking, verbal, oral, oral, and we learn by talking. And these people love small groups. You know, you got people in your small group that just won't hush. You ask a question. Yeah. Don't you just love those people? I do because that means I get to sit and listen. I love it. I love it. I love to be around people who love to talk. That means you get to listen 99% of the time and just respond, you know, that's good. And then they keep right on. But they, that's the way they learn. Then you have by doing. And uh, I love this. this is, I, I'm just sort of repeating here what I heard Rick said. But he said, there's people who don't like to listen. There's people who don't like to talk. And there's people who don't like to read. They're usually called men. Yeah. You don't learn to play golf by a lecture. You learn to play golf by doing it. You don't learn, learn to rebuild a 350 Chevy engine by reading a manual. You learn to, by getting your hands greasy and pulling the engine out of the car and doing it. Men, that's the way you learn. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now that, that, that's going to blister your hide, but I'm going to tell you as kindly as I can. You are the greatest immaturity that is identified first in the body of Christ. If, churches, if the churches that are dying have men that quit, churches that are dying have men that never stepped up to the plate. Churches are dying, have men that you will do everything. Man, you can drive a truck. Man, you can operate equipment. Man, you can build this. Some of you, man, this, yes, I can do it, man. Just give it to me. I can drive it. I can do it. But when it comes to your spiritual faith in front of your children, you will not take ownership of that. That is not a good thing. God did not create you that way. You have the ability to lead. That's the reason you can take out an engine and build it. When I was 14 years old, I taught myself to take apart a 350 engine and work on it. When I was 20-something uh, years old, I took a motor out of a truck and built it in my backyard and, and learned how to do it. I didn't have a dad. I didn't, I didn't have nobody to show me how to do that. I just did it. How do you do it? Because God designed me to lead. God used what he put inside of me to know how to lead. That's why we all grow in different ways. Men, I want to challenge you with this. Church, we can't survive without you. I can't be an effective, good pastor without you. And, 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 and it's horrible to feel like you fail 
people in that area because you want to walk with them and work with them. And here's what's really struggle sometimes is you see men with such powerful spiritual gifts. Man, I mean, you see the gift of encouragement and you see the gift of leadership and you see the gift of giving and all these different gifts that you see in people. And it's so important. The church is not going to survive without you. So I'm asking you this morning. I'm asking you this morning. I know there's so many things you got to do and there's so many things important, but I'm going to say the same thing I always say. If you had seven days to live, what would you do in this next seven days? That has been tying up your schedule. Puts a new perspective on things, doesn't it? Our young people and our children and our babies and our nursery, they're all important. I think when we talk about growing in different ways, we think that the church is just always going to be here and all you've got to do is just come sit in your seat. Church, God wants you to be a vital part of the body. We cannot survive without you. And that's why we have to con con consistently do what we're supposed to do. Uh, Job thirty three fourteen. God speaks in different ways, and we don't always recognize his voice. Growing up, and, and this is what I thought, and, and I had this very same thought too, but how I've been in ministry over 20 years, and I asked myself the question, how can people come to church week in, week out, week in, week out? How can people serve in ministry as a pastor, as a staff person, as a missionary? And you can't even get them back to church on Sunday night to teach our children. How, how, how can people come to church for 20 years and, and they never grow and they never have joy and they become and they just stay in that rut in life? How does that happen? I'll tell you how it happens. A lot of times it's the church's fault. Because we don't challenge and we don't push. Today we are seeing that we grow in different ways. We need to find and use each and every one of those ways. How can people in a church do nothing? Church, God is, wants you to do something. Every area that you're struggling with in your life has to do. It's a spiritual problem. It's not a physical problem. It's a spiritual problem. How would, if a baby stays a baby and never grows up, that's not something to laugh about. That's a tragic thing. It's awful when people have mental problems and they're born to where they cannot be um, effective living life like we can today. But for some reason or another, they may have been born with a disease or something that's wrong with them. They're still just as special to God as you are. They never had the chance. But what does it look like when you have the power and you have the ability to grow up and mature and you don't? That's tragic. It's tragic today when we see, we don't see us growing spiritually. Number three is this. We grow when we develop spiritual habits. Your character is the sum of your habits. And, and, and if you agree with that, say amen. You do what you want to do. You do what you value. Uh, if you really and truly believe Jesus is coming back, you would be where you're supposed to be on the Lord's day. You would. There's no way you would let anything distract you if you really, truly believe that with all your heart. And for you to say, well, I've got everything right. I'm okay. I'm not worried about that. You've just proven the greatest sign of immaturity because you're not burdened over nobody but yourself. I'm burdened over people that don't know. Why? Because I used to be one of those people that thought I was right and didn't know. Today, we're going to have outreach. We're going to show up here, and we're going to be going on outreach. You know what we're going to do? We may just pass out revival flyers. We may just go tell people we love them in the name of Jesus. We need people on the team who can just go and play with a baby or play with a demon-possessed cat or, or whatever. I mean, when, when you start sharing in the house, those cats go crazy. The phone always rings. We might need somebody to go around the back of the house and cut the telephone cable. I don't know, but, but, we, but we need uh, so many different people to come and be a part of that. And, but that's, that's, it develops a habit. You can't say you have the quality of kindness unless you're kind all the time. You cannot say you're faithful to church unless you're faithful to church all the time. What if I, and this is a good illustration I had in my material and it's so good. What if I told Connie that I would be faithful to her 28 days out of the month? Well, that would be good for February. Does that make me a faithful husband because I'm faithful 90% of the time? Partial disobedience is total disobedience. 
That's why when it comes to the time of giving to God what belongs to God and serving God like we're supposed to and, and part of your family faithful and part of them not, that's, I mean, come on, you can't do nothing. You can't make your kids love God. But you sure can pray them into the kingdom. I need to let that lay for a minute. I'm trying to say this as kindly as I can. We are so ignorant in the United States of America that we have made sure our children want for nothing. But we have not prayed for them. When we know that we, that we can pray that God will give them a harvester in their life or an opportunity for them to hear and don't get me wrong, you, you, you can't pray them to be saved, but you can pray them to have opportunities to hear. I want to I I clarify that. I mean, uh, there's some denominations that think after somebody's dead, you can pray them out of hell. You cannot do that. You have, you have a responsibility right now to receive Jesus as Lord of your life, and if you don't do that now, you're not going to have any more chances after this life. But praise God you have one now. And when a mom and dad knows that, they will do everything in their power to seek God the way they're supposed to. Here we do to set up this, uh, the disciplines, you know, when you have spiritual habits. I love to do the call to joy because what it does, it talks about one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And we disciple people and then we get a scripture memory. And then you're, you're taking a journal and you're journaling, you're writing down your prayers. And listen, guys, listen, I feel you, okay? Hey, I got you, I feel you. But listen, if you don't feel like writing five paragraphs, just write down one word. Just write down one word. Take your phone. If the Holy Spirit tells you something in the middle of this and you just want to write one, one word and don't let it be shut up, okay? Just write down one word. I'm just, I, know, I just had that thought. That's what I would have wrote down. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just being honest. But, but I want you to write down something that can change your life, that you can focus on. Uh, and why? Because God, God gives us this, and it's, not, it's, it's for a very important reason. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you develop habits? How, how do you do this? You do it by repetition. You do it over and over and over again. Why? I promise you, you let a mom holding her baby, and that baby gets sick, and you'll hear prayer like you've never heard it before. Do you know most prayer is preventive maintenance? Most prayer is preventive maintenance because God is answering things for you that is affecting things in your life that will never happen to you that could have. You see, you, you, you can change the way that we live and the way that, and when we pray and we ask God, by the way, God changed his mind several times in Scripture because people in the Old Testament prayed. And ask God to consider if there's one righteous man, if there's, if there's 30 righteous men, if there's so many times God hears the hearts of his people. It's not going to affect God's will. God's will is going to happen. There ain't nothing you can do about it. But you sure want to get on the same page with it. Amen? John 13, 17 says this, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you practice them. God's blessings come from doing and living what's right. What happens when you practice good habits? You grow up. You grow up. That's what we do when we train our children. We want to teach them to do this. Hebrews 5.14 says, Solid food is for mature people whose minds have been trained by practice to know the difference between good and evil. These are different translations, but these translations are to make you pull the truth out of the Scripture. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you did not know what to do? Have you? You ever had a place and something come up and you didn't know what to do? And all the, this is to help us to know how to make decisions based on faith and not based on feelings. It's so important for us to know how to do this with our families and with our children. Listen, I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. Five people from this church in the past seven years came and talked to me before they left this church. Five people. What does that tell you? And I know it. There's no way I can talk about this without singling people out. But I didn't single them. They singled themselves out. Is it mature to leave a home and divorce somebody without sitting down and talking to them first? 
Is it mature for you to just abandon because you have a difference of opinion and you never sit down to try to work things out? Is that maturity? Maturity is when you come and there may be a parting of ways and it may be different. But praise God you were mature enough to sit down and have a conversation about it. The body of Christ is just as important and more powerful than, your, than, than what it means to have a marriage because it is such symbolic of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And whether you like it or not, God calls people to have the responsibility to be over a body and be over people. And he tells it's, it's strict and it's, it's weighing on us. But when you have, there's, in Etowah County, I bet 90% of every person in Etowah County, and this is where we live, I bet you when they left, they never talked to nobody. I bet there's so many people in this room, you left the body of Christ and you never had a conversation with a man who prayed over your souls. He did something wrong or somebody did something wrong. Did you stop loving him? Did you stop caring because they didn't do what you thought was right? Church, I'm telling you, there is an immaturity today that is leading into our schools and the way our children respond to each other and things, it all comes from what everybody is watching us do. So you need to make sure that we grow up. You seek God the way He wants us to seek. You practice the things. You, you be trained by practicing the God. What does that do? You practice loving each other. The difference between successful and unsuccessful people is that successful people develop habits that others won't. Disciplines are good decisions. You need to be disciplined in paying your bills. You need to be disciplined in telling somebody, if you ever give somebody your word, you need to keep your word and do what you said. You need to have integrity and good disciplines in your life. Church, there's so many people and folk, we just don't realize that, that we allow that stuff to get into our life and we're just thinking, well, God's going to forget. It ain't about God forgiving you. It's about God's results being inside of you. Now, the, uh, I thought about this. Successful people are just people who set good habits. You believe that? Say amen. Saban's a good football coach. Nobody can deny that. Whether he's saved or whether he's lost, I can't say that. But I can tell you this, he knows how to win a football game. He knows how to pick football players and he knows how to coach them. But there are still people going to be negative in the stands about a coach that knows what he's doing has won so many national championships that we don't even know how to keep up with them no more. That's not a good thing. We've got where we can't celebrate winning. We've got where we've won so many times, and I say we. I'm not no big Alabama fan, and I'm not no big Auburn fan. And praise God, I, you know, I just don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. I don't do that. I, I watch Alabama. I bet you I've watched five games in the past two years, and I don't get caught up in that. Now, I may pick on some of y'all because I like to watch your face when I do it. But, but I just want you to know that I'm not, I'm not going to wear my Alabama jersey, until they t especially since, until they take the Nike thing off of it. And, I, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking that today we just develop good habits. When you develop good ha habits, you're going to see good results. That's what you do. And I know, for you Auburn fans, I love y'all. I do. Uh, God loves you, too. God loves you, you know. Uh, <laughs> most are not willing to be that disciplined. And uh, true spiritual disciplines will not run off the tracks because you have a tough situation. True spiritual condition, a sp true spiritual disciplines will not run off the track because your life gets hard. This is where we begin to see who's mature and who's not. Your life is going to get hard. You are going to be persecuted. Church, we're going to be persecuted in the middle of this campaign because God knows that we're going to be praying for people that they don't, they don't know about it, but the demon and his devils know about it. And I don't want you to give in when that happens. When persecution comes your way next week, I want you to say, I did something right. Don't you dare say you did something wrong. So many times, not being mature, that's what we say. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.25 says, All good athletes train hard and practice to get better. 
They do it to win a prize that won't last, but practice to win a prize that will last forever. During these 40 days, we're going to focus on habits. We're going to meet in large worship like this, and we want people to be faithful. We want you to be here. We want you to stay. If you've ever done anything in your life, Try in your integrity to not let anything, and please, guys, listen to me. I love you. I really do love my men. But when I challenge you like that, please don't be offended by me trying to talk to a man as another man. Try, don't let me do that. Sometimes I can be full of myself. Sometimes I can just get so bum. I can. <laughs> I'm just like you. If I get out and play a softball and, and somebody comes up to me and tells me I can't, I'm going to kill myself trying and, and or I'm, I, No matter what I'm doing, that's just the way we're wired because we lead. I, I need you to finish this 40 days. And if at the end of this 40 days, if you give all of your heart to pray unto God and you are not satisfied by what God has done in your life, you come to me and we'll sit down and talk about it. But I'm asking you for the sake of your kids and your family and our church and your pastor, would you please just give everything you've got to this. Just give 15 minutes a day. Just 15 minutes a day of just, just giving God don't, no, no distractions and just let God speak to you. And I promise if you struggle in the middle of this time, you come to me and I will help you. I will come meet with you. I will come do whatever I have to do to pray with you or whatever. I'm telling you, I will do whatever I have in my power. Be faithful to worship. Be faithful to small group. Small group is important. I want you to read on the screen Acts chapter 2 verses 46 and 47. It says, every day the believers had the habit of meeting together in the temple courts to worship together and also in their homes for fellowship. They ate together and celebrated with happy and thankful hearts. Church, we need small group time. Why? Because we can't, we can't meet all of your needs in just worship. And you need a family. You need community. When you separate yourself from small groups, you're going to make statements like this. You're going to say, well, I just don't feel like I'm a part anymore. And I don't feel like anybody cares anymore. You know, I just kind of feel like nobody just really talks to me anymore. That sounds like what a one-year-old child that becomes two or three and they go to kindergarten and they found out that nobody liked them and they went and told their teacher. When you become an adult, it is our responsibility to make people feel welcome. It is our responsibility to help people to grow. It is our responsibility to invest in people's lives. There is no one sitting in this room that your job is to receive from them and not give back. Are we clear? You see, that's the purpose of growing up. That we know these things. But for the first 300 years, there wasn't a church. They all met in homes. They did that. And then it began to change and become structured. Uh, then the habit of daily time alone. We want you to have prayer time and Bible reading. And church, listen, everybody in our church is not doing it. They're not doing it. You're not having a devotion time and praying like you should. Why? There's too many things that's going on that's distracting people. If you will do this, you will know how to make the right decisions of the things that distract you. You will, you will make the right one. And listen, there is times... Hey, church, let me say this. It's not about you being here all the time. It's about you being there all the time. Amen? It's not about you being here all the time. But listen, don't be at home... Sleeping in your bed, when we're equipping and investing people, and you're a part of the body right here, integrity, don't, don't sit down and say, don't, don't become like that. Say, hey, they need me, and we do. Hey, there's somebody there looking for me, and they are. And that's, what you, that's where this is important. Hab, habit of memorizing the Word of God. We need to memorize Scripture. Hide thy word in thy heart, that I might not sin against thee. This is something we need to do in our life. Would you like someone to say that you lived a successful life? Would you like for somebody to say something for you that you lived a successful life? Let me ask it this way. Would you like somebody to say that you did not live a successful life? You don't want anybody to say that, do you? You don't even want to say that. We want, if we're going to have fruits in our life and people see this, people is going to begin to see that something amazing is going on inside of me that's bigger than me. Guys, you, you have to admit, 
in this church. That there's something going on inside of Joey Hanner that's so big that Joey Hanner can't take credit for it. You've got to admit it. My wife will be the first one to admit it. She knows that what's going on in our life right now, it's an act of God. God's doing this. He's been doing it since October 22nd, 1995. And it was about a year before people could actually see it, but it happened. Uh, Joshua 1.8 also says this. Always remember what, that is, what is written in the book. Read it, think about it every day, and be sure to obey everything written in it. If you do this, you will be prosperous and successful in life. Prosperous, by God's sign, is about receiving the riches of his kingdom. That's not talking about monetarily thing. That's about you being prosperous in kingdom fruit. It also says the success in your life. I want to be successful, church. I don't want to be a failure as a husband. I don't want to be a failure as a pastor. I want my wife to feel like I'm the spiritual leader of my home. I do not want to feel like I've let her down or anybody else down. And you have to admit, when we do that, if I become, if I become henpecked, okay, I'm going to say this, if I become henpecked and I only do what makes my wife happy, I am not going to be, I am, I'm going to grieve the Spirit of God in my life. Now, I listen to my wife. We talk about a lot of things. But she don't override what God tells me to do. And neither do you. When it comes to my relationship with Jesus, my spiritual disciplines are so strong in my life, I can obey God and, not, and, and, and love you at the same time. This is, where, this, this is where growth and maturity comes in. You cannot be changed and tossed about and every wind of doctrine change how you feel and what you think. You have to know what truth is. Number four. We grow when we help each other grow. Spiritual growth is relational, which means we're better together. If you think we're better together, say amen. Romans 1.12 says, I want us to help each other with the faith, with the faith we have. Your faith will help me and my faith will help you. You will never grow to spiritual maturity by yourself. You will never grow. Name one person that's a loner that went by their self that you would take your babies to and have them raise them. I met with someone yesterday, and they're inviting us for a kind of a explore, kind of a trip to see if it would work for us to the Holy Land. But it's not a trip. Part of it is get to preach in Cana of Galilee. The you get to go to Capernaum and see the Sheep's Gate and everything that we preached on in that series and what we were doing. You actually get to go and preach, but it's a mission trip. You go and there's a there's a seminary there, and they're working on these Muslims. They're so fascinated by education that they'll agree to come in and hear the gospel and be trained under the gospel just to get to go to that school so we're going to go in and we're going to make a school and make it to where it's conducive to worship and then we get to go out do you know that mamas in Israel are going ahead and giving their children to be raised in that atmosphere before they're born Today. Is there anybody in this room spiritually has ever grown to a spiritual level that you could even imagine doing what Hannah did in the Old Testament? And it's really going on today. Church, here's what I'm begging you. Don't let God have, don't let I, don't want say, I won't say this right. Don't let persecution be the only reason we start serving God. I do not want them to suffer persecution. The way it's going right now in the church in America, you have placed, I have placed persecution on them. Because we refuse to have spiritual disciplines and grow up. Your boy is going to be persecuted in a way because of the sins that we allowed abortion. We have allowed so many things in our country that has killed innocent people. And nobody recognizes it because we're so spiritually immature. And sometimes when you hear people preach with passion, it's because they're begging or pleading, church, please, my grandbabies can't, I, I can't, I can't stand the thought 
of, of that. I just, I can't, I know it may happen. I'm praying Jesus comes back. I just want him to come back and just take us all in the air. Amen? I, I, mean, I am. I, that's, that's what I'm praying. I just want you to see my heart, and I want to be real in front of you. Uh, we have to help each other. God wired us that way. He wired us for community and small groups. And, and the body is the cure for immaturity. It, it, it's just the way it is. Uh, if you think you don't need it, then you're the one I'm talking to. The person in this room, if you think you don't need it, you're the most immature in the room. You're the one I'm talking to. You need this. You need community and you need the Word of God saturating your soul. Because there's no way you would tell yourself that you're not jumping in anything if you did not understand that. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us be concerned for one another, to help one another, to show love and to do good. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another and all the more. No church build. Let me say this. Why do we want to grow our small groups? Why do, I, why do we stress that? Why is it so important? Let me explain it to you. And I'm going to have to hurry here. We want to grow in our small group, and here's why. Because they're important for the health of our church. This church is not, the only thing that's going to keep this church here in 20 years is our small groups. The people who come to work, now I know you may work a job that pulls you out, and you leave here and go to work. I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about the one that goes and you start doing your chores, and you start going fishing, and you start doing the things that you're not supposed to. You don't understand the value of what it means to invest in other people's lives. It's not going to stay here because of you. we got to become intentional and grow up to maturity in ball play community. This community has been saturated with people who understand traditional church, which means we just know we go. But we have forgot to become the fingers and the toes and the mouth of God. There Now, don't get me wrong. There are prayer warriors in your community that is unlike prayer warriors, I believe, anywhere in the world. They have prayed this here. We're not experiencing it, Union 3, because we did this. We're experiencing this because God did this. There are people who prayed revival into this area before I was ever born. Before I was even known. I'm the answer. And you're the answer of what God wants to do. Now, why is small groups so important? That's how we care for you. That's how we take care of you. There is no way with a church as a thousand in membership that we can take care of people who just come sit in the sanctuary. We can't do your funerals. We can't know when you're sick. We can't, and, and we can't know that. The only thing, the only way we have to drive caring for our people is to have many families all in our church. And that the only way we can minister to you is by you to become a family in a small group. We will miss people when you're not in a small group. We know what's wrong. We have people who take care. If you've been blessed by a small group in this church, say amen. And I'm sorry that I'm sealing like I'm kind of getting it, but I'm watching the clock and I'm trying to get through with this, okay? It is impossible for us to care for the needs of people who only sit in a service. It's impossible. And it makes me feel like a failure. It makes me feel like I, I can't, I'm not doing things right. And it makes me feel like I'm missing people's families and I become desperate. And it affects my preparation time. It affects my preaching. It affects the way I love on people. Everything I've experienced in seven years that caused me to be something I'm not is by the people who just refuse to grow up. Doesn't mean I don't stop loving you. I'm your pastor. And I love you, but we have to grow up. And somewhere along the line, you start eating meat. What does that mean? A man that can eat meat can cook his own steak. Cook his own steak. You'll go home and cook a steak, and you'll tell people, man, they can't nobody cook a steak like me. Man, I'll put it on there. I'll sear it, leave it five minutes. I'll flip it over, leave it for five minutes. I'll take it out, put it on. Man, it just falls apart in your mouth. Boy, I sure would like to hear you say that about this. You see, all we need today is to just grow up and join the small group. I know it's uncomfortable. Can I tell you this? It's not a school class. You're not going to be tested. It's not going to be something where you have a grade. God's the only one that's the teacher, and God is the one grading us. That you're, that's not like that. We will give you everything you need during this time. And, and tonight at 5 p.m., you'll get a book like this if you hadn't already got it. And we go through, and this is everything you need. We're going to offer all the things for you to grow to spiritually and everything that you need to be. Uh, 
Number five is we grow when we expect to grow. I love this. Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done to you. You will grow because you expect to grow. Expecting to, how, do, how do you expect to grow? What is, what is the miracle? What's the breakthrough I want God to How do I set a goal? Church, if you expect nothing, you'll have nothing. You've got to expect God to do something. Your husband's lost. Expect him to get saved. Man, if your children's struggling and lost, expect them to get saved. Barry reminded us in staff meeting this morning uh, or, or, or when we met before the service and we prayed and we prayed back, Kiss been back at a staff meeting and we all got together we prayed very specifically for God to do something. He did. He did. He answered that prayer. Is it because we're special? No, it's because He's powerful. You have not because you ask not. I'm telling you, this is where we need to grow so that we can experience these miracles and breakthroughs in our life. There was one day a young man was going after Socrates. And I love, I've, I've, been, I've read a lot when I was in seminary, I read a lot about Socrates, and I love the story behind him. This young man chased after him and chased after him, and Socrates just run out in the water, and this young man just chased him out in the water. He just let him keep talking. He asked him, he said, when can I be your disciple? When can I be your disciple? Finally, old Socrates just turned around, grabbed him by the collar, and held him down under the water until he just absolutely couldn't take it no more. He raised the young man up. He's grasping for breath. He said, when you begin to desire truth like you desire air, he said, you can be my disciple. We have made a joke today out of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We have, we have made it seem like it's so easy and it's just you, anybody can do it. Church, the highest calling on your life is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. When you're not doing that, that's not going to end well. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for our body. God is blessing our body because we're growing up. Last thing is this, number six, we grow when we commit to grow. Growth is not automatic, it's intentional, it's a choice. You have to choose to grow. One year from today, what do you want to be? What do you want to look like? Jeremiah 29, 13 says, God, you will find me when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else. This is God saying, he's telling the people, you will find me when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else. If right now you would cry out for God more than you, if you found out you had cancer than you did last week, you've got a lot of growing to do. I think we all would to some extent, but somewhere along the line, we've got to, you know, we're trying to develop relationships and trying to, to do things in life and raise our families and raise our children. But honestly, how many of us have been doing it? And we, and I, church, I'm, as your pastor, I'm going to be vulnerable this morning. I need to become a more powerful prayer warrior. This morning, before I came out here to preach, I got on my face before God right there behind my desk. And I had the thought of somebody walking in on me. And I was thinking about locking the door. And I said, well, praise God, somebody needs to walk in on me and see their pastor doing that. I'm afraid today that we're just making light of something that can be powerful. We have to covenant with each other. I'm here for you. Stan, I'm here for you and your family. I love you guys. I'm excited about watching you grow and, and the things that I'm seeing God do in your life. I know where he lives. Every time I ride by his house, I, I pray for him. Man, I'm watching so many families that I can just list right now, and I'm seeing it. And, I, and, I, and, and listen, I, I want to see, see you grow. Miss Ginger, I go by your house. They change the road. They change the road. And when they do, they, there's not as much traffic that goes through there. But we used to go to Gaston School. You'd ride up through there before I ever knew Miss Ginger. I'd look up in the woods, and I said, that is the prettiest place I think I've ever seen. That porch back in those woods. I said, man, who is so lucky that they can live there? And man, I get, I get to meet her and Bobby. And, 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 and Bobby, you know, he was just, he, <laughs> he is a trip. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I love it. But I love my memories. I love having that. I, I absolutely love it. But I want people to ride by and they look out here in this field and they say, man, did you see what God's doing? Did you see? Man, it's just so, it's so clean. It's, it's, it's so beautiful. Man, God's people. 
Man, isn't it amazing that you see God's building? Man, somebody's lucky to live there. To go there. In our community, I want people to grow up spiritually. They say, man, they're so lucky to have that body. Church, as your pastor, I'm lucky to be pastor of this church. I'm blessed. Nehemiah 9.38, in view of all this, we are making a covenant together in writing, and all of us are signing names to it. And, and what our problem is, is 2 Corinthians 13, 9, our greatest wish in prayer is that you will become mature Christians. The greatest problem we have in the church of today is people are afraid of commitment. Church, don't be afraid of commitment. D.L. Moody tells this story about a young man. Barry, if you would, just be making your way up. I like it when you play. It makes me feel like I'm doing something. <laughs> uh, D.L. Moody tells of a guy who was getting ready to enlist in the Mexican War. He told his mom, told, his, told her son, said, son, I don't want you to go. I, I, I don't want you to do that. And uh, he ignored his mom. He said, she said, I want you to become a Christian before you go. You can't go to that war and not be a Christian. This guy said, well, mom, he just refused to do it. So that mom said, I'll tell you what. He said, she told him, said, I'm going to send you a Bible. I'm going to highlight the verses. And at 12 o'clock every day, I want you to know I'm praying for you. He got in some situations there. He took that Bible and he never intended to read it. He's in the middle of war and, and guys, honestly, there's only a few guys in this room that may even know what war looks like. We have no clue. How a sinking feeling of fear when the enemy's coming at you. And it was about 12 o'clock and he realized my mom's praying. He took that Bible and he went off behind a tree. He went to that verse that his mom told him to go to and it was outlined. He went behind that tree and he surrendered his heart and life to Jesus Christ. Sometimes as parents, I know we pray and we want to see results right then. The results doesn't come always in our time. It's the way that we show them. This young man, he knew his mom prayed. He never questioned that. He was so confident in her faith that he wanted his faith of his own. And he prayed and surrendered and invited Jesus Christ in his heart and life. How would you feel if your child went to war right now? Do they show faith? Have they seen it demonstrated in us that they know what to do? If they're in danger or harm's way? Church, we're in a battle. The enemy is after our young people. They're after our middle-aged people. They're after our senior adults. They're after the enemy is attacking everyone. And I want our church to know when it comes down to praying, there are people in the body of Christ and we are praying for you. If there's something missing in your life, you need to seek God and find what that is and find His answer. Not your answer. You find His answer. This is a great opportunity for you to do this. Right now with so much thing, so many things going on in our community, so many people asking questions, it's not what you say that's going to answer their questions. It's how you live. And you can't have a prayer life unless you invite Jesus Christ in your heart and life. Unless you have a genuine relationship with Him, you can't communicate with God. Your sin separates you from Him. If there's anybody in this room, the first thing that we need to do to get right with him this morning is, God, I surrender. I give you my, your pastor, I said it this morning to God. God, I surrender. God, forgive me if I've hurt people or forgive me if I've done something I shouldn't or forgive me for being, God, help me to be kind. Help me to share truth and be kind. Help me to be bold and be meek. I'm asking you to join me. I just want to make a difference. When I look out, I have. 
I need you. If you're not here, I don't feel like I made a difference. I wouldn't even have a calling if it wasn't for you. Hey guys, I'm the pastor of Union 3. My name is Joey Hanner, and uh, we are so thankful that you've been able to listen to the message today. But I want you to know that God has a plan for your life. And today, when we think about salvation, uh, I was one of those church members, one of those people that said I prayed when I was younger, and uh, but my life did not change. When you, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your life will change. God has a plan for your life. You see, He created you for heaven, but you can't earn or deserve that because heaven is a perfect place. And God says, I'm not going to let one sin into heaven. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we think about sin, we think about murder, we think about stealing. But to sin is what we think is, is our thought life. And we are just sinful by nature. And but Jesus came where it doesn't have to be that way. God loves us. He said, I'll solve that problem. I'm going to send my son Jesus. He sent his son for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whoever believes in him will not perish but have what? Everlasting life. You see, God came to give you life. And he wants us to be more than a church member. He wants us to be more than someone that prayed a prayer, said a decision. Praying a prayer is the greatest power there is because that is our tool and the instrument God give us to repent. He said if you'll repent, he said times of refreshing will come in your life. You see, in our life, God looks at us, but he can't see, he can see us. We can't have a relationship with him because this sin separates us from God. When we take and we have intellectual, we know that God exists. We have intellectual faith. But we just believe that He's there. But we don't really have a relationship with Him. Uh, we have temporal faith. Temporal faith is, well, God, I tell you what, if you'll fix this in my life, I'll turn my life around. Well, where does my sin go? It doesn't go anywhere. Well, God, I tell you what, if you'll do this in my life, I promise you I'll turn over a new leaf. It'll go for a little while, and then it just will go right back into the same old, same old. Why? Because we think we can change ourselves. Friend, you can't change yourself. If you could, you would have already done it. Only thing that can change your life is by God's grace. He came into this world so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. That's why the scripture says, all like sheep have gone astray, each into his own way. But God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, he takes his sin, he casts it as far as the east is from the west, and there's one mediator. His name is Christ Jesus. The Bible teaches that. It also teaches in first or in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. So can you go to a time in your life that you trusted Jesus? If you never have, you can do it by just saying, Jesus, I'm sorry. I repent of my sin. I ask you to be my Lord and be my Savior. I am trusting you today to save me. And you will be my Lord and be my Savior. If you've done that today, we're proud of you. And we'd love to hear from you here at Union 3. Go to u3bchurch.com or just call the church office and let someone know, 256-494-9180. We would love to hear from you. And thank you again for watching here at Union 3 Baptist Church. We love you, and we have a great big old time.